All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this meeting on the Committee of the Revision of the Penal Code, which is now in session. I am Mike Romano, committee chair. Uh, let's begin with a quick roll call of, of uh, committee members in alphabetical order. Assembly Member Brian, he is on his way. Judge Espinoza. I'm here. Uh, Professor Ochin. Here. And I know Senator Skinner is not able to join us. So we have three members of the, of the committee with us, so we can begin. Um, we have a busy agenda today, and we have more than a dozen expert witnesses here to discuss uh, driving under the influence of alcohol and drugs, and specific reforms to improve road safety and equity. We will also, of course, take a few breaks along the way, including lunchtime around noon. Uh, we'll close with public comment. This is our first meeting under changes to the bagley keen Open Meeting Law uh, that became effective last year. So our legal director, Tom Nozowitz, has a very brief update on what those changes mean for us and the meeting today. So Tom, can you take it away? Yes, okay, and there's Professor Ocean, great. Uh, Rick, can you share the slide real quick? So th th uh, th there's changes to the bagley keen Open Meeting Act law, which is the law that governs uh, penal code committee meetings. Uh, the law allows us to continue meeting via Zoom, uh, and there are just two things I wanted to mention. Uh, the, the first is that we have to have a physical meeting location where members of the public can come and watch the meeting. That's where Rick is this morning um, at a conference room where we have a little bit of office space in Sacramento. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge that and thank him and, and Megan for doing that for us today. And the second is what's on the screen here, which is I think what we've done in the past, but now it's required by law, which is that members of the committee have to visibly appear on camera during the meeting. Uh, the exceptions are if you have an internet glitch or there's an issue of connectivity and it becomes technologically impractical, uh, you can rejoin the meeting uh, without your video turned on. You just have to say, you know, why you're rejoining without video. And the other thing is, is for something like this, if we're screen sharing uh, and you're not as visible, that's okay too. So um, that's, I think, the only things that are really pertinent to the committee members is, uh, you know, just keep your camera on during the meeting or if there's issues, there's uh, some flexibility in the law for that. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, so today's topic is uh, driving under the influence of alcohol and drugs. And uh, honestly, um, this is obviously something that I've you know been aware of, um, you know, pretty much my whole uh, life, but I hadn't really uh, appreciated how um, important it is to the overall functioning of our justice system and how we can improve, how there are true opportunities I think, to improve public safety uh, and uh, equity concerns. Uh, DUI is one of the most common crimes in California and across the country, and accounts for more than one out of 10 arrests in the state. Public and road safety issues are obvious. For the past two decades, roughly half of all crash fatalities in California have been drug or alcohol related. According to the most recent data from the DMV, there were more than 1,900 alcohol or drug-involved crash fatalities in 2020, which represented a 29% increase for fatalities involving drug, drugs compared to the year before. At the same time, California has made tremendous progress in the area. 15 years ago, there were nearly 200,000 people arrested for DUI. And in 2020, there were just half as many arrests. Since 1990, there's also been a 51% reduction in reoffense rates for people convicted on their first DUI. Today, we'll explore the data, research, and practices from other jurisdictions to learn how California can do more to re reduce DUIs and avoid ineffective, costly, and sometimes racially disparate punishments. With that said, let's get started. So uh, today, we'll begin with a brief presentation by staff on some of the relevant data and the proposed recommendations. Uh, Rick, can you take it away? Yes, thank you. One moment, let me get my screen shared here. All right, so as Mike mentioned, I'm gonna start just with a brief uh, data presentation. And I'm gonna start with data that was um, highlighted in our memo, but it's a good uh, jumping off point for our discussion here today. This first chart uh, shows the alcohol and drug involved crash fatality rate from 1995 to 2020. And as always, our rate is per 100,000 in California's population. The blue line is alcohol only uh, crash fatality rate. 
and the orange line is drug involved rate, which notably is a bit of an overcount because it includes the uh, drug involved, the, the drug only and drugs and alcohol uh, fatality rate. But as you can see, we've had uh, a pretty big decline in the alcohol only crash fatality rate uh, that declined pretty steeply all the way until 2010. But uh, in more recent years, there's been a bit of an uptick. Uh, the orange line shows that the drug involved crash fatality rate has uh, pretty steadily increased over the years. And at this point may even outpace the alcohol involved fatality rate. And uh, with as with the other charts, our most recent uh, 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 data year available is 2020. Moving on here, this chart is going to show the DUI arrest rate. And we're going back a little bit further, all the way back until 1981, until 2020. And here we see this pretty steep declines in their arrest rate uh, for DUIs. And even more recently, if you look at uh, from 2010 or 2015, there's been a pretty steep decline in the arrest rate. Uh, there was a, a, a big decline in 2020, um, uh, but that is most likely associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> Finally, this chart shows the completion rate of people referred to DUI programs. These are the programs that courts are required to order people convicted of a DUI to attend and complete. You have to complete these programs in order to become a licensed driver again. And what we see from the blue bar, those are people who are, or, are convicted of a first DUI in order to attend and complete the classes. And you see a fairly good completion rate, around 70% but there's still about 30% of people who don't complete those classes. And again, these classes are required to get your license back. But when you look at second DUI convictions, you see that rate uh, goes down a lot. And it's uh, around 30% of people that are ordered to complete these classes. Uh, only about 30, a little bit more than 30% actually complete them. And then next, we're just gonna move uh, to highlighting our staff proposals, just to keep them in the front of, the mind, of your minds as we uh, kick off our discussions today. So our first staff proposal is to reduce the per se blood alcohol limit to 0 0.05 from down from 0 0.08 and to create presumptive judicial diversion for many first time offenses. Um, we think these recommendations go hand in hand. If we're gonna lower the BAC, we should also create an avenue to divert uh, these cases. Uh, and the presumption would be to direct judges to grant diversion for first time DUI offenses unless there's some type of aggravating factor. That could be a high blood al alcohol level, which is currently set at 0.15%. If there's an injury or death or a minor in the vehicle, that person would not be eligible for presumptive DUI diversion. And then notably, our recommendation is to uh, specify that if a person were to accept diversion, even though they wouldn't be convicted of a criminal offense and have it on the record, if they were to ever be charged and convicted of a second or subsequent DUI, uh, that diversion uh, offense would count as a prior. So their next offense would be a second and a third and so on. The next staff proposal is to expand the, the use of DUI collaborative courts. And again, we think this is something that may go hand in hand with the first proposal because of the amount of cases that uh, are processed, first time DUI cases, especially that are processed a year in our courts. Uh, if we were able to remove some of those cases through diversion, there is more um, a, a, a ability to use court resources to uh, address people com uh, convicted of a second or more DUI. And so the proposal here is to require all people convicted of a second or more DUI to, uh, to participate in a collaborative court or some other type of intensive supervision. Again, noting back to the chart showing that the people convicted of a second or more DUI aren't completing some of the things that they're required to, uh, a more intense supervision can benefit public safety. And then finally, our, um, sorry, our last proposal is to streamline license suspensions. In the memo, we talk about how there's this admin per se process that kicks off as soon as somebody is arrested uh, for a DUI, their information is sent to DMV and the DMV begins to uh, 
process these administrative penalties well before a person is ever convicted of an offense. And that includes a license suspension, but that once a person is conv convicted of a DUI, their license is suspended again, even if they've already served a suspension as part of the admin per se system. And so the recommendation here is to require that the person's license is only suspended once so that they're not suspended through the admin per se system and then receive a second suspension once uh, they're convicted in the courts. So those are our staff proposals uh, for, to, for today's discussion. And again, our hope is that you just keep them in mind as we uh, kick off our discussions today. Thank, thanks, Rick. I hope you'll stay on for the Q&A section that's coming up um, because I think you might be helpful for that too. And as always, um, our staff memo I thought was especially good um, this time around. Uh, thanks, Rick and Tom, Joy. Um, so I encourage everybody to review that. Um, next, <clears throat> we're gonna hear from researchers from the California Department of Motor Vehicles who will present data on DUI, on DUI statistics. Uh, we'll hear a short presentation and have opportunity for Q&A. We are joined by Bayless Camp, Chief, Research, Chief, Chief of Research at the DMV. Mr. Camp will be assisted by two members of his staff, Dario Sachi and Ainsley Mitchum. Mr. Camp, please begin. Thank you very much. Hopefully my audio is fine. And I'm going to here just to talk about all of the data that we have available publicly um, about our, um, that's available through our annual DUI MIS report. Um, so Dario, can you um, go to the next slide? <clears throat> so I'm, I'm just going to go over the fact that this is a legislatively mandated report. I'm going to talk about at, at a very high level the data sources that we put together and and coordinate and aggregate um, in doing this report. Some of the data does not come from DMV, but it all goes into one report so that there's um, for, for ease of use by the public and by stakeholders. And I'm going to highlight two sections of our most recent report, just because it, they're, they're things that may be relevant for discussion, and then uh, leave some time for questions. Next slide. So uh, we have been publishing this report uh, for quite a while now. Um, so this was originally developed in 1989. Um, it's intended to be the main depository, main data repository for assessing the performance of the DUI countermeasure system. And I talk about it as a system because there are a number of components, some of which um, Mr. Owen has already um, highlighted before. There have been subsequent uh, legislative um, input on this uh, report, particularly around DUI treatment programs. I would say on those specific parts of the report, some of the evaluations that have been called out have not been conducted in the past couple of reports because of data concerns. We're reimagining and revisioning those aspects of the report that have to do with evaluation of the effectiveness of DUI treatment program. We're currently preparing the 32nd annual report for 2023. We expect that to be um, published um, in the next couple of months. Um, and we're very proud of this report. Um, it has been cited by the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration as a model for other states. And we, um, we, we always wanna keep in mind at DMV how this is used by the broadest array of stakeholders. And we're constantly looking for input to make it better and more useful by whoever um, is interested in making a difference in reducing the toll of fatalities and injuries due to alcohol and drug impaired driving. Let's move to the next slide. <clears throat> so just general um, information about data sources, and I can go into a lot of detail about this if you would like me to. So most of the information that we present is pegged to the arrest year, by which I mean we obtain from the Department of Justice a list of all individuals who have been arrested on or detained on suspicion of DUI in a given year, and then we follow those people through the countermeasure system. So when we report in a given year, there's usually a two to three year look back period, depending on whether or not we're talking about convictions or crashes, so that we can look at what happens to folks who um, are involved in the DUI system for whatever reason. So our arrest information comes from the Department of Justice. We then have 
administrative per se actions. So the license suspension that DMV takes administratively for persons who are detained for alcohol impaired driving. There is no um, APS action for drugs. That uh, information comes from DMV driver records as properly initiated by local law enforcement agencies. We then have DUI conviction information, and this is information that is transmitted to DMV from local courts when someone is convicted and an abstract of that conviction is then placed on the driver record and whatever sanctions are associated with that conviction then can be um, recorded and, and required as legally appropriate. Then we have sanction information, so DUI treatment program, um, enrollment and completion, IAD installation requirement um, and installation, whatever fines might be required, uh, whatever jail or probation time might be ordered by the court, all of that is located on the driver record as transmitted to us by court abstract of conviction. And then we also finally have crash information um, which we obtain from the statewide integrated traffic record system, which is the statewide crash repository. Um, and that's administered by the California Highway Patrol. And certain information from crash reports is transmitted to DMV for placement on driver records. And we're particularly interested in those crashes um, that have, quote, a had been drinking what code? So indication that the driver um, was alcohol or drug impaired or both. <clears throat> so lots of information that we integrate um, and display in this report. Next um, slide. All right. So we've got a lot of dashboards. And what I would Mr. say, Kim, here... I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to interrupt. We'd love to get to the act to the to the data that's most relevant to our discussion because we're really sort of tight on time. So I, I understand. Got it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, we're not going to go through all of these. We're just going to highlight two. DUI summary statistics. Anybody who's who's present can go to this website. It is on DMV's website. Look at it at your leisure. Um, there's lots of information to be digested here. So some of this was highlighted verbally earlier. This gives the broadest brush view over time of what's happening with arrests, convictions, and crashes. So if you're interested in any of this information, it is publicly available. And some of the highlights um, of recent changes um, Rick talked about earlier. So just wanted to point people to this um, so that they know where to find it if they uh, want more information. Um, Dario, can you go to the next uh, dashboard? So then I'm going to talk about post-conviction sanction effectiveness because this is where we've really done some effort at looking at what do we know about how changes to the legal system have impacted DUI over time. So any kinds of questions that the panel may have about how to interpret any of these, we're happy to answer. I would focus on these slides in particular. So when we think about the impact of laws on a matter like DUI, you can talk about general deterrence. So the reducing first time offenses among the general population and some of the information that we presented earlier talked about that. You can also talk about specific deterrence, meaning someone has been arrested for and convicted of DUI once, what is the impact of the laws on preventing them from doing it again, a second or third time? I would call out specifically, if you see in the middle on the right, there are um, some blue lines here that compare different cohorts of offenders. So that top line is people that were arrested in 1980. In 1980, we didn't have APS laws and we didn't really have a, a 0.08 or 0.10 limit. So over for people arrested in 1980, over the next five years, more than a third of them were picked up for DUI again. Then over the 1980s, a series of changes were made to the DUI system, including the creation of a 0.08 limit in 1990, and also the creation of the administrative per se system. So in particular, if you look at the difference between 1984 and 1994, that captures 
the impact of those two changes to the law, the shift to 0.08 and the creation of APS. And there was a clear step down in recidivism between 84 and 94. There's a whole lot of other kinds of information we could speak to about uh, the impact of different kinds of laws, but this is just an example of information that we hope might be useful um, for whoever is interested in this issue. So last slide, um, and then I will be done and we can uh, answer questions. So um, all the charts and graphs that I've mentioned today are available to the public um, on DMV's website. We also have single subject reports available um, for review about specific laws um, that, that have been asked for information by the legislature or the governor's office, and those are all available. And in addition to those um, single subject reports, we have done a number of DUI related studies under grant agreements with the Office of Traffic Safety. Um, those aren't always published um, on DMV's website, but they were done in agreement with OTS. They are available documents, and we can um, share those um, with, with anyone by request. And I give some examples here of topics that may be of interest to this committee. Right. I think that I've said my piece, and we're happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I have a few questions, and then... Um... Hopefully other members of the committee will jump in. So I was wondering, and this um, can go to, to anyone, including Rick. Um, our crash, California's crash and arrest rates um, dropped pretty dramatically. Um, and I was wondering how that compares to other states. Is that something that we've done here or is that comparable? Is that going on across the country? Is that question to me or to other members any, of the panel? Any of them. If you know the answer, jump in. The National Highway Transportation Safety Administration publishes information that compares um, all states. And so that information is available on NHTSA's website. I, I would just, so is the, do, you, do you know the answer or you just know where to get the answer? I don't know the answer off the top of my head at, at Rick, 10 o'clock you know in the, the morning. Rick, do you know the answer? I think some of our other panelists will be able to speak specifically to, the, to that question, Mike. Okay, so we don't know. No. All right. Um, so do we have any suspicion of what uh, we can attribute the decline in arrests and crashes to? I appreciate um, what Mr. Camp said about the decline in the re-arrest or the reconviction rate, um, especially between the, you know, the 80s and the 90s. But is there anything that we can, is there any other um, interventions that, or things that might have reduced the number of crashes or fatalities that we know of? Rick, I'll start with you. Um, well, I think as, as uh, Bayless mentioned, it's some of our laws changed in the 80s and the 90s, including developing a per se BAC limit that started with 0 0.10 and that moved to 0 0.08. Additionally, uh, California law changed to uh, require an automatic license suspension upon arrest. So that system. Right. Those, those, those were the two. And it's and Mr. Camp said that that and you attribute that, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Camp, to a real reduction. The data that you described was about the re-arrest rate. Is that correct? The APS um, law also had a general deterrence effect, and I would be happy to share our published reports on both of those topics. So we did an evaluation of the general deterrence and the specific deterrence of the APS law, and I'd be happy to share that with the panel. And you, 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 you attribute that specifically to APS law, not to the change in the BAC limit. Those two laws occurred very closely connected in time, so it's a little bit hard to disentangle, but we do have some evidence that speaks to the different effect of each law separate from each other. And in your opinion, do they, the APS was more effective? I mean, you, you mentioned that a couple of times. I, I think separating different components of the countermeasure system is it's a little bit difficult to do because they occur in combination. I will forward by email those reports to Mr. Owen, and if if they were, are, are of use, uh, th then they can be shared and discussed. Fair enough. Thank you. Does anybody else from the committee have questions?
Tom, do you have anything to add? You know, I, I think one thing that really struck us is the um, in is sort of the higher fatality rate with drug involved driving. Bayless, I don't know if, if there's anything you can speak to that because that really stood out is that we seem to be doing a great job or not a great job, but having some effect on um, the alcohol side of things. But um, the drug side of things seems to be um, creating a bigger uh, public safety risk. We have recently completed a project for the Office of Traffic Safety that speaks to um, DUI drug um, convicted um, individuals specifically um, and talks about the, the crash risk um, for persons. And I'd be happy to share that report as well. That is not available on our website. That was an OTS grant report, um, but I can share that with the committee if that is of interest. Correct, again, correct me if I'm wrong, Rick, or Mr. Camp or anybody. Um, so uh, as in the slide that Rick uh, showed, the number of crash fatalities of alcohol versus drugs and alcohol are, are close to being the same, meaning the number of fatalities in California involving drugs and drugs and alcohol are, are close to the same. Is that correct? That is broadly in, in recent times. Yes, that, right. Correct. Yes, it's changed over time. Correct. But the number of overall arrests, they're much more just alcohol related arrests. Is that correct? Rick? Um, I don't know if arrests are broken down into DUI drugs versus DUI alcohol. I think the my understanding. Mr. Camp, is that arrests are broken down into just DUI arrests, and they include both categories. I, but I think the conviction data shows when there's drug involved. There's only about 6% of convictions had the drug aspect. So it's not a perfect measure, but I think that is supporting what you're saying, Mike, is that it seems like a lot of the DUI driving is, is alcohol, um, but those that involve drugs seem to present a much bigger uh, safety risk. Right, fatality risk. Uh, Judge Espinosa, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I just am curious, uh, this question is from Mr. Camp, whether there's data that reflects what the most common or um, prominent drug is in drug-related uh, DUIs? Um, not for California specifically, unfortunately. The information that gets recorded on DMV um, uh, driver records has to do with the subsection um, of 23152 and 23153. Um, and so it, it's just drug involved, really, or drug and alcohol involved. The specific drugs that would get tagged would come from toxicology reports that don't get recorded on the driver record. There is um, some information nationally that could speak to that, um, and I could follow up uh, with those reports. They're, they're, they wouldn't be DMV, it'd be NHTSA. But do you know what the answer is, or are you just um, nationally? I hesitate to to answer. My understanding is that it is generally marijuana is the most common, but I would like to point to a published report to be sure. Can I ask a question, Mike? Of course. Um, Mr. Camp, on the DMV website, I, my understanding is that each, um, there's uh, county specific reports of the type of sanctions that are uh, imposed for DUI offenses and that, uh, the DMV has been able to identify some county county differences in the in the rate at which certain sanctions are imposed, particularly like ones that are uh, required, for instance, like jail, um, that even within between counties and even within counties that there are some differences in how those sanctions, how courts are applying those sec those sanctions. Can you speak to that at all? I, I your your characterization is correct that we have included as part of our DUI M MIS um, county level information as is reported to DMV on the abstracts of conviction of what kinds of sanctions are required by courts as part of the conviction. And then separately, what are the offenders doing to fulfill those requirements as part of their license reinstatement process? So yes, we have county level information for a number of aspects of the DUI countermeasure system, in, is including there any indication of, between the dip, and then this will be my, our last question. Mm -hmm. Is there any indication again? This goes to Rick or to Mr. Camp or anybody. Is there any indication? So different counties have different sections. That's what you're saying, Rick. Correct. 
Correct. And within counties, they are applying sanctions differently. All right. Is there any information that different that any county is doing a better job than others in terms of reducing crashes and crash fatalities and arrests based on their sanction system? Or not or forget about based on sanctions. Is there any counties that stand out as particularly good or particularly bad in California? Um, I think that we could look at the data and see the DUI rate in specific counties, and some counties are much higher than others in terms of arrest or convictions. Whether you know a higher or lower rate is directly related to the sanctions that counties. No, that, I, I, I withdrew that. I withdrew that part of my my. Okay. <laughs> but um, but there are counties that are quite different in terms of fatalities and arrests. There are counties that are quite different, but also, I guess what I was bringing up and uh, highlighting is that even within counties, you look at a sanction like jail, and you'll see that in one part of the county, jail is imposed in 90% of first-time convictions, whereas in another part of the county, jail is imposed in 70% of first-time convictions. So you see a lot of county inter-county disparities um, that are interesting. Right. No, I get it. I'm trying to zero in on any intervention that we think might be useful. And Mike, uh, uh, Professor Ochin has her, had her hand raised for a while. I know you told Oh, that. sorry. I missed that. <laughs> Professor Ochin. And then and then let's go on to... So go ahead, Professor Ochin. My apologies if this was in the staff memo um, or in, in your... Um, your um, your materials, Mr. Camp, but I'm wondering if you have information on the demographics for folks who are racial demographics for folks who are arrested, conviction rates, um, as well as uh, demographics for the type of sentence that's uh, or the type of the, the nature of the conviction, whether it's a misdemeanor uh, or felony. I, I noted in the memo that that's uh, somewhat discretionary in terms of um, district attorneys and, and the choices that they're making with their charging decisions. So I'm wondering if you have any data um, regarding uh, demographics for arrests and for convictions? Sure, happy to um, to speak to that. If if there is if it's of interest, we could pull up another dashboard. We do the arrest information that comes to us from DOJ does have the individual's race or ethnicity marked as uh, recorded by the arresting officer. That information doesn't get recorded on DMVs. A driver record. There's no race or ethnicity information on our stuff, but we do use DOJ, and that is part of our annual DUIMIS report. Um, so there, there we can. That information is is available. Also, as regards the um, crash information, um, crash, and I believe Dario is pulling up. Yes. Um, so for DUI arrests by uh, by race and ethnicity. Um, the information that we have up here is for the most recent arrest year, um, and it and it speaks to both um, what the population is of the state of California. That's the orange bar um, that comes to us from the demographic research unit at the Department of Finance based on census information. And then the blue bar is the proportion um, of arrests um, where the person's race or ethnicity was marked by the arresting officer in that category. Um, so that, that information is available to you, to your question. There's also in a different section, there's information about crashes um, that, that displays the information in a similar way. Um, so we have not to, the other question you asked had to do with conviction information. We have not looked at that. Um, so, so that would be a, a, a separate question that we'd have to follow up as a different, as like a, a defined research project. We'd never looked at that question specifically. So not to put too fine a point on it, but uh, as we look at other areas, as with other areas of our criminal legal system, uh, black people and brown people are overrepresented relative to their population. White people are underrepresented in number of arrests for DUIs. Although as unique as this might be, DUIs might be, uh, it seem to follow a problematic pattern. Uh, Assembly member Brian. Yeah, no, uh, thank you, Mr. Camp. It in doing your uh, analysis, especially you know between the the multiple agencies, DOJ, DMV, were there any variables that kind of struck out to you as as missing, or like we should be collecting this? This would be informative if we were collecting this, or potentially give us a greater greater picture of of what might be happening here. Um, that is a wonderful question, and I I would <laughs> being a, a, a dream. Yes, I, I was going to say you're you're asking me to dream about what data um, could be available. Um, 
one of the most interesting things that we try to track in the DUIMAS has to do with um, who's not getting convicted. So people that are arrested and then they are and then they are not convicted. So we can we can track that um, because we get that. But we if somebody and, and we can see a little bit if somebody is convicted of, for instance, a wet reckless conviction, which is typically a plea down for first offenses. But if there was information about diversion programs, that's not something that we currently track. That's not transmitted to DMV in any way. And so we can't really speak to how that is currently being offered, if it is. And it sounds like that might be of interest to the committee. So that would be my initial answers. Any information about diversion programs might be useful to think about how would that most appropriately be recorded? Where should that information reside? And then if it is used for further sanctioning, what would be the appropriate mechanism for that? Hopefully that answered your question. No, I, I, absolutely. The uh, the the data, the former data scientist to me knows that you know so sometimes the stories we can tell are are only based on the data we're we're capturing, and so sometimes the the first step is making sure we're capturing all the things we need to be. Absolutely. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sachi, Mr. Camp. Appreciate your time. No good deed goes unpunished. I'm sure we'll be back in touch. All right. Thank you. Now we're going to begin our panel discussions. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for sharing their insights with the committee today. As is our custom, each panelist will have five minutes to make opening remarks, and then we'll receive, uh, reserve the remainder of our time for Q&A and conversation with the committee. Panelists, please know that if you've given us a written submission, we have read it. So in your opening, please move quickly to hit the high points so we can move on to the conversation, which is the most important and productive parts of our meeting. Everybody understand? All right. Our first panel will present insights from research about driving under the influence, continuing on for, from our conversation from Mr. Camp and, uh, and Mr. Owen. Our panelists are uh, Jim Fell, who's the principal research scientist at NORAC at the University of Chicago, of NORC, excuse me. Is that how you pronounce it? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, Lauren no no Noth, or Noth Peterson, senior research scientist at the Washington Public Safety and Policy Center. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Oh, you're on mute. Knoth Peterson, but oh, Knoth. everyone gets it wrong, so it's fine. <laughs> Got it. No, it's all right. Thank you for the correction. And then uh, Steve Raphael, Professor of Public Policy, University of California, Berkeley, um, who we've had many times before and is super helpful to us. Uh, Mr. Feld, we'll begin with you. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to thank the committee and Rick Owen in particular for inviting me. Uh, to speak today. Uh, I am Jim Fell. I am a principal research scientist at the NAT, stands for the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago, but I'm in the Washington, D.C. area. I've been involved in uh, traffic safety research and impaired driving research for a good number of years. And in all my years of research, I'm not aware of better rationale for a law or a DUI law then to lower the blood alcohol concentration BAC limit for driving from the current 0.08 to 0.05 grams per deciliter. It has solid laboratory science behind it. The public supports it. Evaluation studies in other countries show it to be effective in reducing impaired driving fatalities. It has a general deterrent effect, so it affects a lot of drivers. Uh, when it's adopted, uh, and it is cost effective. It won't cost the state anything to lower the limit from 0.08 to 0.05. Uh, all of the arguments I've heard, I've been able to counter with research. So what I like to say is there are seven very good reasons to adopt a 0.05 BAC limit. <clears throat> first of all, Utah was the first state to do it. And at the year after they adopted the 0.05 BAC, they had a 19% reduction in their fatal crash rate. 19% reduction in fatal crash rate. Seven good reasons. Virtually all drivers are impaired with regard to driving performance at 0.05 BAC. 
the risk of being involved in a crash increases significantly right at 0.05 BAC and higher. Lowering the illegal limit to 0.05 is a proven effective countermeasure, which has reduced alcohol-related traffic fatalities in several countries around the world and in Utah. It's a reasonable standard to set. It's not one or two drinks after work. The public supports it. Two thirds of the public say they support lowering the limit from 0.08 to something lower. And most industrialized nations around the world, as a matter of fact, over 100 nations have BAC limits at 0.05 or lower. And to make matters even more important, impaired driving fatalities have been increasing in the United States. And I know they have in California too. The, the uh, COVID years of 2020 and 21 had huge increases in impaired driving fatal crashes. And so we've got to do something. And this is a this is a proven measure. And as I said, I've heard all the reasons by opponents not to adopt it, but I can counter every single reason. And to conclude, there's one other law that has scientific research behind it, and that is mandatory alcohol ignition interlocks for all convicted DUI offenders. While installed on DUI offenders' vehicles, uh, recidivism rates are reduced by two-thirds, according to meta-analyses. And such a law has a general deterrent effect. A recent study showed that states with all offender interlock laws had a 26% fewer impaired drivers involved in fatal crashes compared to states with no interlock laws. So those are two laws that I would recommend based upon the research. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure we'll be back during the Q&A section. I appreciate your um, brevity. Um, Ms. Ms. Knoth Peterson, did I do it right that time? Yes. All right. Thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen correctly. So I did submit um, some slides for you all. So I'm sure you've read over them. I'll go to the highlights. But uh, my name is Dr. Lauren Kenneth Peterson. You can call me Lauren. Last name is a mouthful. I currently work at the Washington State Public Safety Policy and Research Center, um, but I previously conducted research pretty thoroughly on DUIs while I was in Pennsylvania. I've also done DUI work in Finland, um, interestingly enough. So pretty familiar with the literature, and I'm here today. Uh, Rick invited me to talk about some of my research on a specific DUI diversion program that operates in Pennsylvania, and um, I just want to highlight a couple of the findings from that study and then discuss a little bit about what may be um, kind of underlying the effectiveness of DUI diversion for first-time convictions, and that's based on the characteristics of individuals convicted for the first-time DUI versus those convicted of repeat convictions. So as I mentioned, um, the program in Pennsylvania is the Accelerated Rehabilitative Disposition. For the eligibility, it's primarily first-time um, DUI convictions or it's the first in 10 years. So there are some instances where if there's enough of a gap between convictions that they can be eligible again or eligible if they didn't have it previously for an ARD. Um, no one could have been injured or seriously or killed or seriously injured in, in a crash um, related to the DUI and there couldn't be a passenger under the age of 14. Um, the citation for this study was also included in the memo and briefly discussed um, by Rick. So just as an overview of what the ARD does, um, the ARD sentence includes a license suspension, but it's really minimal and it's based on blood alcohol content. So if it's 0.08 to 0 0.10, uh, it's no license suspension. In, in your mid-range, 0 0.10, 0 0.16, it's 30 days. And then above 0.16 or drug involved, um, it's 60 days. It's mandatory participation in alcohol highway safety school, probation for six to 12 months. And then they have to have a drug and alcohol assessment. Um, if the BAC was greater than 0.16, it's mandatory to have the full drug and alcohol assessment. If it was lower than um, 0.16, then they have a uh, court reporting network. It's a pre-screen that determines flags whether or not there's likely an underlying alcohol use disorder or a drug use disorder, substance use disorder that would necessitate the completion of the full drug and alcohol assessment. Those assessments determine any required treatment. 
Um, there's legal financial obligations, but it's limited to the fees for the programs and for the um, drug and alcohol assessment evaluation costs. So there's no fines uh, and then any other conditions imposed by the court. If an individual successfully completes their, their sentence, then their record is expunged. On the right-hand side here is a standard sentence. I'm going to highlight what the difference is between an ARD sentence, a diversion sentence, and a standard sentence. Um, there's three big ones, the first being license suspension. So again, if it's less than 0 0.10, there's no suspension under a standard conviction. But if it's 0.16 or, or 0 0.10 or greater or drug involved, or if there's an accident with bodily injury or damage to minors, then it's 12 months for your first DUI. Other difference is the jail term. So um, jail mandatory jail sentences are determined by the BAC level, and there's no jail sentence for an ARD um, disposition. And then finally, the legal financial obligations are much greater under a standard guilty conviction. You can have a fine of three hundred to five thousand dollars on top of all of the same um, fees that you would pay under an ARD. When we looked at 40,000 individuals sentenced in 2006 and 2007, we used statistical techniques to eliminate any systematic differences between those populations and then evaluated four-year recidivism. Our analyses found that in the full population, there was no significant difference in recidivism in a four-year follow-up period, but everything trended in the right direction. So um, individuals who received that standard guilty conviction were, were still slightly more likely to recidivate. But we did find significant negative effects for a conviction for women and for people of color. So in looking at this chart, that light gray bar is the um, percentage of recidivism for those who received a guilty conviction, a standard sentence. And the dark gray bar is the recidivism for that diversion disposition. And there are really pretty significant gaps in the likelihood of recidivism for our um, populations who are people of color or for females. So overall, there's no um, specific deterrent effect of conviction. There's no identified negative effects of diversion. So there's nothing indicating that diversion necessarily increases the likelihood of recidivism. And actually, it has uh, unique benefits for women and for people of color. And I can go into um, discussions about the reasons for that. But this is pretty consistent with older findings back in the 90s as well. Um, I've also done quite a bit of work looking at the risk of recidivism for individuals committed of a DUI, have developed DUI risk assessment instruments. Um, and in general, we find that recidivism following a DUI conviction is significantly lower than non-DUI convictions. I think we, we already have established that with the, the data that you saw already in this panel. Um, there's a small population of individuals that account for the majority of repeat offending. Um, and so there's a significant difference between those who have no prior DUIs and one prior DUI, and that's all regardless of BAC. There's really not any strong evidence that BAC is a unique predictor of recidivism. We like to believe that higher blood alcohol content um, may mean that they're more dangerous, but, but that doesn't really hold out in the literature. And we found in general that arrest itself is often a strong enough deterrent um, that the harsh sanctions with a guilty conviction really aren't necessary or don't provide a unique benefit. And that has to do with um, kind of rational thought and the way that an arrest recalibrates perceived odds of identification. Uh, in general, my research has identified three categories of individuals who engage in DUI, and the, the first time DUI diversion programs are really targeting um, the first and the second group. So the first group being non-criminal one-time DUI offenders. So those who are unlikely to engage in offending behavior, they don't have an underlying substance use disorder. This was just casual drinking, had too much fun at a party, and decided to drive home. But otherwise, they don't have a proclivity to, to do this often. There's problem drinkers who drive, and that's individuals who are unlikely otherwise to engage in criminal behavior, so generally law-abiding. Um, and the theories of criminal behavior really don't explain the behaviors of this population. And so it could be social drinking or normal age-graded experimentation with alcohol, where we see higher consumption rates in the, the um, early adulthood. Um, and it could be in later years when you have empty nesters returning to alcohol consumption or coping for significant midlife changes. And these are individuals that need treatment, not sanction. And then finally, that population, again, that small population of potentially repeat individuals who are really problem drivers or problem individuals who also drink. They have a tendency to engage in those general antisocial deviant behaviors. And so they're going to have a, a more diverse criminal record. So when we look at predicting recidivism, who's most likely to uh, 
commit a DUI and if they get arrested for DUI to commit another DUI. Um, it's really difficult to predict that because of the low rates of DUI recidivism, but in general, criminal history and age are the strongest identifiers. Um, and they're they're much stronger predictors than than BAC. So uh, if again, if you have a prior property, prior person, prior drug conviction, those individuals are more likely to recidivate. That's a, a indicative of that problem drinkers, problem individuals population. If you have a prior DUI conviction, they're less likely to recidivate if that's all they have. Um, and if they did recidivate, they're more likely to recidivate with a DUI. So again, that's the problem drinkers who drive. And then um, drug versus alcohol matters. So I know Mike had a question um, about the differences in, in DUI and drug. And if you want to revisit any of your questions, Mike, I can I can go on for days, I think, about all three of the questions you asked. But um, drug-related DUIs do have a higher association with recidivism. And it, it, it potentially is a different population than alcohol-related DUIs. So um, in general, I think that there's pretty strong evidence for a deterrent effect with diversion for first-time um, DUI arrests. There's really good data coming out of Pennsylvania that about half of their population of DUI arrests goes into this ARD program. It works. It's, it's successful at reducing recidivism. And it's particularly effective for individuals who would um, have unique experiences of the stigmatization of the sanctions that, that come from a guilty conviction. So that's women and people of color. All I'm right. Stop sharing. Thank, thank you very much. Um, we'll come back to you during the question and answer period. Uh, Professor Raphael Steve, it's good to see you as always. Well, thank you for having me. Take it away. Um, one second. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for, for having me today, folks. I'm going to uh, give a little overview of what we know about the effectiveness of uh, ignition interlock devices that Dr. Fell had mentioned in his presentation. And I'm basically just going to provide an overview of what these devices do, how they're used, what the research shows, and uh, the relevant sort of changes in policy in California in recent years that have impacted uh, how we use these devices. So basically, an IID, it's, it's a breathalyzer that's installed in a vehicle, and it prevents a car um, from uh, starting if someone's BAC is above a specific set level, usually 0.02. The technology has gotten pretty accurate in terms of measuring the blood alcohol content. Uh, it can be calibrated to avoid having somebody breathe in it for you using video um, or a calibrated humming. It requires uh, a sort of monthly checkup with an installer to download data from the device and assess whether it's been tampered. Um, and for the most part, it's actually a pretty standard sanction in the United States, although the rules governing uh, who is required to use it varies from place to place. And in California, for a while, varied from county to county. Um, and just in terms of the broad headlines, so what do we know about about uh, the use of these devices and, and recidivism. So there's a, a fairly large body of literature now that concludes that when it's installed in people's cars, they're, they're considerably less likely to have another incident where they're caught driving under the influence. Um, there's research uh, that it, it relies on randomized control trials for drivers in Maryland, finds a two-third reduction. Uh, there's quasi-experimental research from Holland, from Canada, uh, from Washington State, from New Mexico, and from many other localities that conclude the same thing. And there are now several uh, extensive literature reviews, as well as a National Academy of Sciences consensus panel that, that concludes that while they're installed, people's recidivism rates decline. The one caveat, however, is once the devices are, are, are removed, we tend to see that... Uh, recidivism returns to the level of the control group. Although one, one might mention, as, as we were looking at the data that was presented by Dr. Camp from the DMV this morning, that the recidivism sort of hazard or the likelihood of recidivism drops with time since the incident. And so uh, having an impact at the front end or the first few years after, uh, after an event actually probably is, 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 a, is not something to, to be minimized. Um, I ideas appear to reduce crash fatalities involving alcohol, um, but some research from California suggests that there might be increases in other types of crashes. So there, there have been um, lots of studies that have looked at, at various uh, uh, DUI interventions 
and the effect on crashes. So early work by, by both Tippett's and Dr. Fell uh, looked at the effect of administrative per se suspensions, found uh, uh, it reduced alcohol, alcohol uh, traffic fatalities. Um, Kaufman and Weeb, and then recent work by Tio, I hope I'm saying that name correct at all, uh, involving panel, study, panel uh, studies of, of different states that are that had universal uh, IID requirements tend to show reduction in alcohol-related crashes. Uh, on the other hand, there was an evaluation of a four-pilot study uh, or four-county pilot study in California that I'll talk a little bit more about in, when we get into the policy section that seemed to show that the likelihood of crashes among people who had IIDs and stalls uh, were elevated. And the, their interpretation is that, that since IIDs could be used uh, to shorten one's hard suspension or the length of one's hard suspension, that it might have led to more people on the road who are riskier drivers for other reasons than, uh, than alcohol consumption. Um, a couple other, couple other findings. Uh, there's there's some interesting research that sec that suggests that monitoring the data from the IIDs is uh, predictive or, or actually can be used to enhance uh, compliance. So there's a randomized control trial from Maryland that where uh, individuals are randomly assigned a treatment control group and they monitored the the data from the devices regarding attempts to to start the car when people were had a BAC above our 0.02 or um, people trying to, to sort of bypass the event. And what they did in the treatment group was send them warm, warning letters, increase the calibration frequency, which is costly, both in terms of money and, and time, lengthen the IID period and hard suspension. So they're basically a series of graduated sanctions. And what they found was the treatment group was more likely to actually comply uh, than the control group. And there's some very good research from, from uh, the California DMV that analyzes uh, California's enhanced negligent operator uh, treatment evaluation, which is more generally a system of, of warnings and sanctions uh, that are used for people as they uh, accumulate points on their driver's license with the intent to either deter them from sort of future reckless driving or, or incapacitate them in the, in, uh, in the event that driving privileges are, um, are, are, are uh, um, revoked. And that work tends to find that actually these these sorts of interventions and even the softer touch warnings uh, and the and the sort of indication that there's monitoring can actually imp improve effectiveness. Um, then the final thing that I wanted to note is that that data from IIDs are predictive of future DUI events, right? So um, uh, there's there's very good uh, work that that shows that someone who's tried but um, been locked out of their car several times or tried to bypass a device, that that information is actually predictive of a future DUI event. And I think in most states, uh, information on, on compliance with the IID itself, other than trying to rip it out of the car, uh, is, is oftentimes not monitored. Um, just in terms of the timeline, so this is, I, I didn't include the, the legislative uh, numbers or the bill numbers, but there's a, a nice report from the Mineta uh, Transportation Institute that's, that's um, oh, sorry, that is cited here that uh, gives a, a, a great timeline with the numbers if people wanna look that up. But in terms of California, 93 judges were required to order IIDs for DUI convictions with priors. Um, the adherence to that requirement was partial. In 1999, people that were caught driving on a suspended license uh, that was suspended due to DUI were required to install IIDs. 2006, uh, mandatory suspension revocation periods can be shortened if an IID is installed, something that you see across the United States where IIDs and hard suspensions are used as substitutes for one another. And a big change happened in 2009 when the regulatory authority over IIDs transferred from the, the courts to the DMV. Uh, in the research literature, this is a uh, something that a lot of attention is paid to is who's actually administering the sanction. And it seems when it's done by the DMV or the equivalent of the DMV in other states that the sanctions are, are, are more uniformly applied. Um, there's a, a few other, uh, other things that I'll point out. So in 2010, there was a four-county pilot 
where uh, there was a requirement that IIDs be uh, ordered for all DUI convictions to the end of 2016 in four counties, which is Alameda, LA, Sacramento, and Tulare. And that was actually extended through the end of 2018 when a new statewide requirement was installed um, that for DUIs for all repeat offenses, and then for anybody who was convicted of, I think it's 23153, which is DUI with injury. And uh, um, we're actually working on an evaluation of that change now. And that's my overview. So thanks. And if anybody would like, I have a list of the of the studies here, so I can forward that to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Steve. This is all super useful and helpful as as usual. We have about twenty minutes left for uh, Q and A. I'm just going to jump jump right in, um, Mr. Bell, uh, and then I'll get to you, Assembly Member Brian. Can we just? I just have a. I, I'm a, I'm sorry that I feel so ignorant here. But what is how many drinks ish? Or you know, can you give us sense of like what constitutes 0.05 or 0.08? I know it's body weight and types of alcohol, but can you just give us a ballpark of what we're talking about here? Yes, NHTSA has a report, and as you know, everybody's different, but on average, a 170-pound male would need four drinks in two hours to exceed 0.05. A 137-pound female would need three drinks to exceed 0.05. In a two-hour period. In a two-hour period, two-hour period, exactly. So it's not one or two drinks after work with an hour. It, it's, and most people say you shouldn't drive after that many, that number of drinks. I wouldn't. Um, all right. I have, I have a list of questions here, but I'm gonna uh, go through the raised hands and our community members. Uh, Sunday member, Brian, I think you were first. You wanna jump in? You're on mute, I think. Sorry, um, two questions. Uh, and before that, a, a comment, uh, Professor Raphael, it's, it's good to see you. Um, been reading your work for, for many, many years. Michael Stoll was a mentor of mine at UCLA, uh, and I know y'all have collaborated uh, numerous times. So great to share space with you. Um, my two questions, the first one is with a 0.05, if, if we were to set a limit like that, would we expect that to have any impact on the the racial disparities we see in stop enforcement arrest and conviction already do we think that might exacerbate those disparities remain constant uh, and then my second question is is around kind of the interlock devices i've seen proposals that require um, paying for those devices to be shifted towards people who have been assigned them uh, instead of the the state or a municipality taking on that financial burden and, and just wondering if we how we how we balance out the the public good and and the economic impact to you know what I, I would suggest are probably struggling communities that are most likely to be impacted by DUI enforcement um, and and have greater you know potentially greater instances of of, of driving impaired. So just curious how how those those things line up. Mr. Feld, do you want to take the racial disparities questions, and then um, Steve, do you want to take the uh, cost for the IIDs? Sure. There, there is no evidence that lowering the BAC limit will uh, affect uh, non-white drivers more than white drivers. There's no evidence at all. Um, and to give you an example, that was a concern when states started to pass uh, mandatory or primary enforcement seatbelt laws. Mm -hmm. All right. That means you could stop them just seeing that they're not wearing a seatbelt. A lot of concern that blacks were going to be stopped uh, disproportionately didn't happen. NHTSA did two studies of that. I've got the reports. It didn't happen. So I don't think there's there should be any concern that a 0.05 will result in that. And am I correct that Utah is the only state with 0.05? Utah. And do they have racially broken, broken down... Research. No, but they're mostly white, so it's hard. To, it's hard. To... <laughs> I was gonna. I was gonna say. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Miss No Peterson, you did you want to jump in on this point? Yeah, I just wanted to mention. I know that the question was about racial disparity, but there is um, evidence out there that reducing the BAC from 0.10 to 0.08 had significant increases in arrests of 
women. Um, so I think that there are, there's the potential for some gender disparity there. But again, it's because differences in consumption and how that affects um, BAC by gender. And I wanted to get back to you about the diversion program and how that has some, some real racial implications, but perhaps that's different from the reducing to 0.05. Uh, judges, uh, oh, and then uh, um, Steve, can you answer uh, Senator Member Bryan's question about the cost of, of the um, interlocks? Yes, sure. So certainly, um, I'm pretty sure that the most recent legislation, uh, SB 1046, that's kind of in the, the law of California anyway, has a provision that uh, part of the cost be shifted on the distributor for people that are below a given income level. And it is, you know, it's not costless. For the most part, people who have the IIDs pay for it. And I think it's three to six dollars a day. And you know, you can imagine that families on a on a on a low income that that's going to add up over time. I, I'm not. I, I think in some states you have to pay for the calibration every month. I, I think in other states that's part of the lease that you're paying. That three to six dollars a day includes the calibration. I, I think one could make the argument theoretically that that um, you know if if the IID is actually reducing risky behavior, that that's a benefit to everyone. And it seems like a, a natural place where if people couldn't afford it and we could verify that they don't have the income to pay for it, that it certainly merits being subsidized by the public or, or subsidized within the program, perhaps by people who can afford it and are also undergoing DUI sanctions. But I think those equity concerns are real and the cost is not, not unsubstantial. Uh, Judge Espinosa, I think you had a question. I lowered my hand because um, in answering um, Mr. Bryant's question, my question was answered. Thank you. All right. I, I have some questions. Uh, I, also, I also have a question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, it is, yeah, I don't know what's going on here. I, you have to get my hand up. No, know. it's, it's covered. Sorry, <laughs> that's all. Go ahead. Uh, um, so um, my question uh, sort of puts what um, Ms. Noth and um, Mr. Fell said together. So uh, I want to figure out the causal relationship between the 0 0.05 BAC and the reductions in um, traffic, uh, you know, uh, incidents um, or, or um, DUI-related deaths. Um, so, you know, Ms. Noth, you mentioned that the arrest was a sufficient enough sanction to be a deterrent, that the conviction was not the deterrent um, that the arrest was. Um, and so I'm wondering what a, what we can attribute what happened in, in uh, Utah to. Was it the increased number of arrests um, as a result of the reduced BAC, or was it the set of, you know, the convictions that followed. So I'm just trying to get a sense of where, you know, if we're making recommendations where we should focus our attention and how we might then make recommendations to the legislature on sanctions that may follow an arrest. You know, as Ms. Noth said, punishment is not the driver of the sort of change behavior deterrent. Um, and so that might counsel in favor of diversion programs, more emphasis on, um, you know, supporting people uh, to, to make sure that they don't have a, a sanction on their record that might affect their ability to, you know, uh, obtain housing and so on. And so I'm wondering, you know, what's the, the real driver of the declines that we're seeing in places like Utah and, or in other countries? I have several thoughts here. Um, so I have not looked specifically at the studies that have assessed the pre-post change in Utah, I can speak to the change between 0 0.10 and 0 0.08. I think it is difficult actually to isolate the unique impact that the BAC, the change in the BAC level actually had on reducing DUIs. This kind of go back, goes back to some of Michael's original questions on is California unique to the country and what was causing the decline that we saw from the late 80s, really, through the mid 2000s, the, the late aughts. And it is a national decline that we've seen. It's not just California, that that pattern we've seen everywhere. And the, the literature points to really four different things, none of them being BAC. So one being the change in the population that we see, we saw a shift in the population that was in that kind of risk age of, of 18 to 25, 18 to 30, really started aging out by the, the late 90s. So our portion of the United States population in that 
riskiest age really declined. Um, so that the just fundamental population changes um, cause some of it. And all of this is happening when BAC laws are changing, right? So it's hard to say what was the BAC law change versus the population change. There was also a general decrease in alcohol use in the United States. There was huge investments nationwide um, by the federal government and by states with the development of organizations like MAD and SAD on education campaigns. That education didn't exist before. So we started to see a social, so, social cultural change in the way that we interact with and view alcohol and view our responsibility as drivers. So there's pretty good evidence that that the kind of mad movement um, had and, and big investments in education made a difference. And then also you have to think about the fact that our, our cars are nothing like they were in the 80s. They are way safer. The technology that exists in cars makes it far less likely that an accident, regardless of its alcohol involved or not, will result in a fatality. Mandatory seatbelt laws, all of those things are happening during the 90s and the 2000s at the same time that we see the BAC change. So um, the the big decline, I don't think you can attribute to a change in 0.10 to 0.08. And I think that that's confirmed when you look at the statistics. The, the percentage of individuals who are arrested on a DUI with a blood alcohol content at or around 0.08 is relatively small compared to those who are arrested with a BAC of 0.16 and greater. And that's because 0 0.10, 0 0.16, that's when you start having such significant impairment that you're driving all over the road and it's more likely that a cop's going to say, oh yeah, that person's driving under the, under the influence and stop you. Because of the administrative per se laws um, and, and the imposition of those, now you don't have to be driving crazy. You just have to, to blow a certain amount on, 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 a, um, on a breathalyzer in order to be convicted of a DUI, right? So there's I, I think that if there is evidence that the reduction in Utah really mattered, I don't know that it can be generalized to the United States, but if there is evidence, then I think drawing on my experience in Finland is really um, informative in this area because in Finland, they do have a 0.05 and there, there there's this kind of concern that no one can predict at what point you get to 0.05 and 0.05 for a lot of people doesn't feel like impairment enough to not be able to drive necessarily. Uh, and so they just don't drink at all. If you're driving, you don't drink at all. And so there's a really big difference that if you're the, if you're the driver at a dinner, you flip your cup upside down. And so I think it, it may have the general deterrence effects that people perceive that it's two drinks in an hour is going to get you a 0.05. And so there's, again, that, that fear that the, the increased fear that you would be above that threshold, because we as individuals, that's a scientific calculation that we can't figure out in our own, in our own brains. Right. So um, it's that perception, I think, that would have the impact. But there are so many other things that have driven the decline. Lauren is correct about all those other factors affecting it. But there have, there have been a number of good studies that control for those socioeconomic factors. And they still see a decrease uh, associated with going from 0.10 to 0.08. At least a dozen studies have done that. Also, Arrests did not increase in Utah. Arrests stayed the same mm -hmm. and at the same BAC levels. And they used the same rules of enforcement. Everything was the same. It also didn't affect alcohol consumption. It didn't affect the hospitality industry one iota. It kept growing in revenues. And so all these worries about what 0.05 will do did not transpire. Uh, and they didn't transpire in other countries either. We, we did an estimate of what what uh, would happen in the U.S. if every state went to 0.05. And it would save approximately 1,800 lives a year if every state went that way. It serves as a general deterrent. It's not a specific deterrent. We're not worried about people at 0 0.05, 0 0.06, 0 0.07. What it says is the government is getting tougher. The science says at 0.05, that's the per se limit. And if you're if you're caught driving at that or higher, you're going to lose your license, you're going to be fined, et cetera. And we that's the general just, deterrent. Just the time, I just want to cut you off just because uh I we're just I'm just keeping an eye on the clock real quick. Assembly member Brian. Yeah, just one other question. I mean, I, I, this is fascinating to me. Um, and Mr. Phil, I I appreciate all the work that you've done in this space um, and, and especially those estimates on on what kind of 
uh, impact on saving lives we could have if we moved policy this direction. I am curious, though. I lived in Utah for, for two years as a kid. Are there any cultural factors about Utah that might make the results of that study not necessarily generalizable to other states? I know both in terms of racial and religious demographics, Utah has kind of an interesting relationship to alcohol and caffeine and many other things. Well, I think we all know that uh, the, the most of the population are Mormons, all right? Mormons typically don't drink. Some of them do, but they typically don't drink. I, and Utah started out with the lowest impaired driving fatality rate in the nation when they passed this law. I didn't think we'd see an effect. Neither did a lot of people because it was so low to begin with. But in that first year, and that was 2019, we saw that 19% reduction in the in the fatal crash rate. So it had to be due to that. Right. Then, the, of course, the pandemic came along and everything increased, which, again, I never thought I would see. Uh, I thought the pandemic would cut impaired driving in half because people were staying home. No, people bought more alcohol. The alcohol consumption went up. They drank at home, and then they went out and drove to their friend's house and got involved in crashes. And there was a big uh, uh, proportion of drivers out on the road who were young males. You know, not the responsible people, but young males. And there was a lot of speeding going on and everything else. So um, very, very surprising. Other countries showed reductions in impaired driving fatalities. Not the U.S. Ms. Knuth Peterson. Yeah, and I'd be interested to know, um, Mr. Fell, if you have any. I I can't remember if you spoke specifically to the work that you've done in Utah on racial disparity, because I know that there was a study. The other concern that comes to mind um, from an equity lens is that, as you mentioned, we're not really worried about the people at 0 0.05, 0 0.06, but with administrative per se laws, it doesn't matter if you're not actually worried about them if they hit a breathalyzer at 0.05, they, they're they arrested automatically. It's it's a DUI. And there was a study that came out in 2021 that showed there is significant racial disparity in the enforcement and the likelihood of arrest um, and, and administration of a breathalyzer where people of color are more likely to be arrested. They're more likely to be, to be administered a breathalyzer. And we know the data and the history on the likelihood of, of people of color being more likely to be involved in a traffic stop. And so if they're more likely to be stopped and thus more likely to be administered a breathalyzer, are there concerns that um, lowering that BAC would have a, a racially disparate impact? Well, first of all, people of color don't drink as much as uh, non, as, uh, as whites do. Uh, at least that's what they report. Um, also, the... the uh, I'm trying to think of what what we saw in in Utah, but in other states. Well, anyway, the the fact that we haven't seen any any uh, uh, increase in in arrests of of black people in any of these studies, and I'm talking about Europe, Australia, everywhere. Uh, I think shoots that one down. I don't think that we're going to see anything like that. And you have to be doing something wrong. You got to be doing something wrong to be stopped. So they can't just stop a black person if they're just driving along and not doing anything wrong. If they're weaving or something like that, fine. Then they get stopped. Then they go through the field sobriety tests before the breath test and so on and so forth. So uh, it, it, you, it's going to be very difficult to just pick on uh, non-whites for the arrests. All right. We're running short on time, so and I have a couple of questions, too. I want to hit Steve, Lauren, and then I have a couple of questions. So, Steve, can you go first, quick? Oh, sure. I just wanted to, to speak to some of these racial disparity comments. Um, I mean, I, I think in California, we do know from, from the RIPA data that there does appear to be um, race disparities in pretext stops. Uh, they those don't seem to be for drunk driving, but but mostly for equipment violations and other things. And there's a recent policy change in LA where um, you know we the, we've, been, there was, we've been following this pretty closely. So yeah, yeah. So and, and just one other thing to point out, um, Dr. Uh, Bayless this morning he had presented a 
some numbers on race disparities and arrests. And I just went and looked at the crashes too. And they do kind of align up with one another. There's some, I mean, the disparities, if you look at arrests alone, it, you know, Hispanic are overrepresented relative to their population. African-Americans are represented. When you look relative to crashes, less so, right? So it appears that perhaps there's some differential enforcement, but relative to present in crashes involve fatalities, the disparities aren't as large. Um, so I, I think it's important to, to really think about this topic and think about the equity implications, but it could also be that there are different base rates by group. All right, Lauren. All right, I, had a couple, I have a couple of questions. Lauren, one of the, th and I'm sorry, Ms. Knoth Peterson and Ms. Kibbutz. Um, So question number one, you said arrest is enough. Is there evidence that the schools or suspension or any other sanctions seem to have effect? Uh, the, the, the things that have the strongest evidence for them are treatment. So alcohol highway safety school in Pennsylvania is just 12 hours. It's very minimal. But what, what is most effective is the mandatory drug and alcohol treatment that is a result from the mandatory drug and alcohol assessment. So the drug and, and alcohol assessment explicitly, explicitly identifies the level of treatment required. I see. So you're so if you go into the ARD program, you're assessed, and if you if you trip if you trip whatever score, then you have to get to treat. Yes, and that's a part of your sentence, and so your record won't be as expunged unless you complete your out your substance use disorder treatment. Um, got it. On the diversion piece and the racial disparity piece, I think the evidence showed that um, that the benefits to a, to diversion were especially um, relevant in for people of color. Is that correct? And for women, yes. Yes. So it, is it is it fair or is it too clever by you know to pair a reduction in the BAC level to point of this is this is one of our recommendations to pair the reduction in BAC level to 0.05 and increase diversion. So on the one hand, we would be lowering BAC level, which would increase the likelihood or possibility of arrest, perhaps, I understand the data from Utah, um, but also increasing diversion at the same time. So hopefully counter, counteracting some of the racial disparate impact. Does that, does that seem to, does that make sense for to you? It does. And the big reason is because the, the effects of the, the criminal label. So it's the fact that DUIs are particularly unique in the in their criminal label and that they affect your ability to have gainful employment. You can't be employed in any type of job that requires you to operate a vehicle. In a lot of school districts, you can't be employed if you have a prior DUI. So um, there's just unique limitations that come from that prior conviction that don't exist under an ARD disposition because that record is expunged. Got it. Um, and then my last question is for Steve. And a couple of you mentioned this about the interlock device. They work while installed. There's a lot of caveats while installed. Is there evidence that they should be, is there, should they be extended? Should the time be extended? I mean, if they, if you go back to the, if it reverts back to the mean, I mean, what's the benefit of it? Well, I, I mean, I, so I, I think the research on, on optimal length is, is not great. Um, that being said, I think that there are probably people who are, complying with their not only installing it but but in terms of you know blowing clean tests and not uh not driving other vehicles not trying to to disable it that are probably self triaging themselves as very very low risk and then there are other people who are probably revealing that hey you know what they really need this device a little longer and um it might be interesting to think about um, either rewarding people with good behavior with a, an early release from the IID requirement and maybe graduating the requirement upwards for those who are who are revealing that that um, that they need the device. And so uh, I would guess that there's probably room to do more there. And I think that's definitely supported by research on the predictive behavior on the predictive value of of that information. Are there other panelists that have input ideas on whether or not the um, interlock device period should be extended given the data? Yeah, I agree with that. The the uh, the, the if they have any failures within sixty days of when it's supposed to be taken off, you extend it. And if you extend it, then the further you go out, the, the greater the public benefit. 
and they'll and they'll hopefully learn a lesson. Um, and as far as you know, do states have that kind of graduated enforcement mechanism, or is it just this, or no? There, there are a lot of states considering it. I don't know if anybody's actually adopted it. All right. Thank you um, very much. This was super helpful. You guys are true experts. Really appreciate your time. Sorry to speed everybody along, but obviously we want to try to get as much information as possible. Um, as I always say, no good deed goes unpunished. I'm sure we'll be back in touch. Please be in touch with us if you have additional suggestions that you uh, come across along the way. We're really trying to get it right for California. So thank you so much. All right. Um, I think we're going to go keep on pushing through unless anybody needs to take a quick break from the panel. All right. Seeing, seeing no hands, I want to push through to... Um, our next panel, which is uh, two speakers and won't go quite as long as we as we typically typically go. Um, our uh, next panelists, are they here, Tom? Okay. Yes, um, they are. All right, great. Thanks for joining us. Our next panelists are Ian Goldstein, who's Vice President of Public Affairs for Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and Brandon Green, Director of Policy Advocacy at the Western Center of Law and, pa and, Law and Poverty. Uh, Mr. Goldstein, uh, let's get started. Sure, thanks, Then, Thank you so much uh, to the committee for inviting Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Uh, a lot of what has been said on the first panel, um, uh, we, we have a lot of the same types of recommendations, so I'm not going to go through of the um, one, one stat I do want to state is from 2019 to 2021, California drunk driving deaths did increase by 42%, which is very alarming uh, for us in that uh, reductions in DUI arrests in California and across the country while alcohol impaired driving fatalities increase have galvanized MAD to consider ways our organization can help improve enforcement of DUI laws, including in California. Uh, our recommendations are based on successes in other states to decrease drunk and impaired driving crashes while increasing equitable traffic safety enforcement by prioritizing stops for hazardous driving. So we support four uh, four measures that, that can be taken, which is an all offender ignition interlock law, increasing traffic stops for hazardous driving behavior, lowering the illegal blood alcohol content level from 0.08 to 0.05, and ensuring the rights of victims of drunk and impaired driving crashes are protected. So for drunk and impaired driving offenders, MAD only supports diversion programs that require ignition interlocks and include guardrails, including but not limited to excluding such diversion participation for repeat offenders and impaired drivers who cause an injury or death. Currently, 35 states, not including California, have all offender ignition interlock laws. Um, we urge California lawmakers, the Department of Motor Vehicles, POP prosecutors to implement an all offender ignition interlock program to decrease drunk driving crashes and deaths. Um, you saw in the last panel, the studies of, of the four counties, 74% uh, more effective in reducing DUI recidivism. Uh, for second time offenders, ignition interlocks are 70% more effective than license suspension alone. Um, one thing that uh, was brought up in the last panel was around kind of the notion that somebody just made a mistake, a one-time mistake, or uh, are not usually uh, driving drunk. Well, the CDC found that a drunk driver will drive at least 80 times before their first arrest. So ignition interlocks are a proven effective tool in changing the behavior of a drunk driver. And so that's why we urge California to take that up as an all offender bill. Uh, MAD works closely with law enforcement around uh, officers around the country, supporting enforcement efforts to ensure that our roads are safe. Um, officers are on the front lines of traffic safety every single day. And without traffic safety enforcement and the dedication of police officers, traffic fatalities and injuries would increase exponentially. Studies that focus on equity in traffic stops have found disparities, have found that disparities decrease when law enforcement focuses on hazardous driving behavior rather than other types of traffic stops. Uh, we saw this in Fayetteville, North Carolina, uh, as well as Connecticut. In California, MAD has been made aware of data that shows that people of color are overrepresented in DUI arrests. Um, 
California DMV data found that Hispanic drivers were the largest racial ethnic group among 2020 DUI arrestees at 53.6%, while only representing 30%, 37% of the population. Black drivers made up 10% of DUI arrests, accounting for 5.8% of the population, and white drivers made up 29%. Uh, while they represent 40% of the population. And MAD will continue to analyze this data because it goes kind of against what we've found in other states. So it's very interesting um, and, and, and definitely want to take a closer look at that. Um, MAD also seeks to ensure robust enforcement of hazardous driving behavior, uh, help, that it helps California return to the pre-COVID levels of traffic and safety enforcement. MAD supports lowering the BAC threshold from 0.08 to 0.05. Uh, the research uh, was, was, was discussed on the previous panel, so I won't go into that, but Utah is a great example of a 20% decrease in the fatal crash rate. And lastly, MAD seeks to ensure that the rights of victims and survivors uh, of drunken impaired driving crashes are protected. Drunken impaired driving offenders who cause fatal or injurious crashes should not be granted leniency or receive reduced sentences or diversion programs due to their illegal choice. Victims and survivors deserve justice for a death or injury due to this 100% preventable crime. So um, Matt urges a thorough review of how impaired drivers who cause death or injury are handled in the adjudication process after sentencing with the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Thank you very much. Five minutes on the nose. Was it? Oh, good. Gold right. star. I forgot to start my clock, so I appreciate that. Mr. Green. Thank you. Um, hopefully, I will also uh, be within the five minutes. Um, <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, well, it's afternoon where I am. My name is Brandon Green. I'm the director of policy advocacy at the Western Center on Law and Poverty. Previously, I directed the racial and economic justice program at the ACLU of Northern California, was a clinical instructor at the East Bay Community Law Center, where I helped start a decriminalization of poverty clinic. I was a public defender in Contra Costa County. In each of these roles, I either represented clients accused of and or convicted of driving under the influence or helped advocate for clients to get their licenses back. For the last seven years, I've also been part of various coalitions advocating around these issues, including the Back of the Road Coalition and the Debt Free Justice Coalitions. These coalitions have helped move California forward and away from punitive measures like driver's license suspensions for failure to pay and against exorbitant racialized wealth stripping fines and fees that result in regressive taxation of low income black and brown communities. Over the last years, each of these coalitions and organizations within them have produced several reports that show the deep and lasting harm of existing policies. The most recent of these reports is the So Many Roadblocks report authored by my former colleagues at the ACLU of Southern California. And as stated in the executive summary, the report presents data from 45 of the 55 licensed DUI programs in LA County as a case study to illustrate the wide range of fees companies charge and to document routine violations of state regulations intended to limit how such companies can exploit and profit off low income people. The report also surveys the seven state license based programs run by county. Uh, governments in California and shows that across the board, these programs also violate state regulations by unlawfully limiting access to alcohol and drug education programs based on inability to pay. Further, the report describes the following five key findings. Program costs are too high for low-income Californians. Lack of transparency makes people vulnerable to exploitation. Program fees prevent low-income people from completing DMV and probation requirements. Requiring low-income Californians to pay for expensive programs drives racial inequality, and private nonprofit and government-run DUI programs all routinely violate state, regu state regulations meant to protect low-income people. Collectively, these key findings highlight two broad issues with the existing system and highlight why layer on further requirements and or making criminalization easier by changing existing policies will only exacerbate inequality within the already broken system. These two issues are, number one, the overall racialization of the criminal legal system, and number two, the lack of enforcement mechanisms for the current policies related to sliding scale and or ability to pay programs. First, as to the racialization of the current system, data from the 2024 Racial and Identity Profiling Act Advisory Board report shows that traffic stops continue to be racially driven. Specifically, the data shows that Black individuals were stopped 131.5% oh, more frequently than expected given their population. Moreover, Black people were searched at a rate 1.66 times greater than white people, despite the fact that contraband is found on Black and Hispanic people less and no action is taken after a stop or search more often, suggesting that the Black and brown folks stopped were not, in fact, committing the crime. 
Data from various reports from, number, from members of the Back on the Road Coalition have highlighted the intersections between race, income, and driver's license suspensions. This truth is highlighted by the data cited in the, cited in the memorandum, which the previous speaker already spoke to, um, that Black and Hispanic people overrepresented DUI arrests, despite accounting for 37, well, I won't repeat that because we already, he already said it. Um, but that data is not commensurate with alcohol use rates by race. For example, according to SAMHSA, white people 12 and older were more likely to be frequent and heavy users of alcohol. The usage for various other substances vary. However, none of them justify the disparity seen in the DUI arrest data. The current disparity in traffic stops and DUI convictions suggest that if the BAC is lowered, it is likely that even more black and brown people will be entangled within the criminal legal system. The potential harm does not stop there. Due to the costs associated with entanglement within the criminal legal system, approximately $2,000 for a DUI, time and costs associated with pretrial requirements like scram alcohol detection anklets and alcohol anonymous classes, as well as costs associated with post-trial requirements, ignition interlock devices, insurance requirements, et cetera, the potential for financial harm is real, even as it's understood that fees, quote, have little effect on reducing impaired driving and license suspensions, quote, have not been found to reduce recidivism. Stopping impaired driving and harm and the harm that it can cause is an important goal. However, from the memorandum circulated, there's a very real question of if lowering the BAC level will have an intended effect, given that only one of the two studies cited on this point have shown any impact on accident rates. This potential policy impact, just like the proposed legislation to make installation of an ignition interlock device mandatory for all people convicted of a DUI, is questionable at best, given the research. Now for lack of enforcement mechanisms. As noted in the ACLU Southern California report, not only are their current programs, are the current programs expensive, but the existing programs to lessen their burden are not transparent, which leaves people vulnerable to exploitation. Additionally, many of these programs violate state regulations. This last point is important as requirements are only so good as there are entities to monitor and enforce them. The staff memorandum circulating in advance of this meeting notes that there is no indication that fee reduction programs are widely available. The memorandum also does not report how or if it's known how many manufacturers have been cited or fined under the state law that allows for penalties for up to $1,000 for failure to apply or inform people of fee reductions. I think it's um, notable um, that the report calls for uh, there to be simplicity with regard to the distinctions between the two different uh, driver's license suspensions. I will just note that um, while I was at the EU Spade Community Law Center, um, I actually was in contact with, with some folks from MAD around uh, a longstanding problem, which is uh, there are people who had their license suspended for 10, 20, 30 years from a first time DUI who can't get their license back because they were unable to complete a class. Some of the classes didn't keep adequate records. Um, they Most of the people who failed to complete a class did so because they could not afford to. So the financial burden has now translated into a real burden of people getting their licenses back, which exacerbates uh, existing contact with uh, law enforcement. And so what I would uh, suggest is the suggestions that um, exist within the report that I cited from my colleagues, um, which I'll just go through quickly. So make alcohol and education programs publicly funded services. Um, since state law requires state uh, DUI programs to sustain themselves based solely on fees charged participants, um, removing that requirement of publicly funding this alcohol and education programs to satisfy the requirements for reinstating driver licenses uh, would eliminate burdensome fees and ensure equitable access. Remove indefinite license reinstatement barriers that do not serve public safety. As we all know from previous work done on uh, DUI, I mean, done on license suspensions, people are going to drive when their license is suspended because most people don't have a choice. And so when you have your license suspended uh, three or four times um, past the prior ability period, people are going to continue to drive. And again, that exacerbates police contact. Uh, enforce the state regulations. It is all fine to say that um, entities can be fined, but we have no data suggest that that is actually happening, that there is really any enforcement on any of these programs, any oversight on the uh, DUI classes themselves. And we don't really know anything about the efficacy of those programs. Um, and as noted in the uh, memorandum, almost all of these things don't really have the impact um, suggested. So the IIDs, for example, the staff memorandum says that once removed, the people who would offend, uh, reoffend. The people who would not don't. And recidivism is already extremely low for first time DUIs and even for seconds. Um, so adding either um, more requirements, more fees, uh, more things for people to do may or may not actually have the intended effect of public safety, but will have the intended effect of increased 
who increase police contact and fines and fees. Um, uh, as previously stated, in driver's license, uh, in debt based driver's license suspensions and increased transparency. Um, I think that's about time. Uh, so I uh, appreciate your time and attention. Thanks to you both. Uh, Mr. Green, I'm going to start with you. Um, have you seen in our, our memo and as discussed earlier, um, well, first of all, you should know that this committee in general really seeks to do two things at the same time, both improve public safety and address uh, inequities within the justice system that already exist. And we try to do that you know, simultaneously. And our, our first proposal in the memo attempts to do that in two ways, right? On the one hand, sort of decrease the BAC level from 0.08 to 0.05. We, as you've seen from our previous discussion in the memo, concerned about inequities, particularly racial inequities that might result as that. And one way to address that might be to increase the diversion opportunities for diversion programs, which seem to have particular benefit to people of color. Mr. Green, I was wondering if, how you might respond to that proposal in terms of the concerns that you raised. Oh, I mean, my perspective is that those are two wholly different things. So I think diversion programs um, are great from the studies cited. They seem to have impact. The, the staff memorandum suggests that a arrest for a DUI is enough of a deterrent effect um, in of itself. So that's fine. I don't think having a... Um, a program like that within the criminal legal system actually reduces either police contact or someone having to go through the indignities that come with the criminal legal system. It might reduce the fines and fees on the back end, but thus far, since we've been collecting this data, I mean, for as long as I can remember, I think the first uh, ACLU report, uh, Driving While Black, came out in the 80s. Every study ever done on that shows that black folks are disproportionately impacted by jars like suspensions and criminal legal contact. And there's been no study ever that suggests that black people are worse drivers. Right. So so well, I, I say I, I, I say all that to say that if we already know that there's disproportionate impact as it relates to DUI convictions, but that is not commensurate with alcohol usage. For example, we already know that, you, that driver's license suspensions are not commensurate with some racialized uh, ineptitude when it comes to, to driving. Layering on something like diversion is, is great, but you're still going to have more. The reason it's going to disproportionately impact more Black and Brown people is because traffic stops in the criminal legal system are fundamentally racist. So you're just going to drive more people in, and it's great that they get diverted, but it, it's it doesn't change the reality of the racialized aspects of it, I guess. So, so in other words, and we've dealt with pretext stops a lot, but just in other words, so in, in other words, reducing the BAC level to 0.05, in your mm -hmm. opinion, would just increase the number of stops, which it would, which would inevitably result in disparate impact against people of color. Right, because we already have the disparity in existing. Thing. And I would also just say, just my my opinion based upon the existing research is. It, unless there's other studies that weren't cited, there's there's Utah, which seems to have had pretty good impact. And then there's the second study, I believe, is Scotland, which suggests that there wasn't the same impact. So I don't think that there's enough data to suggest that doing something, uh, I won't say extreme, but it's, it's a pretty large um, change, given that I think the median level of impaired drivers convicted of DUIs is about twice the legal limit. Right. So 0.05 would be significantly um, lower. And there's not anything to suggest except for the Utah uh, study that it would actually have the intended effect because we don't have enough data to suggest that that kind of change would actually do what it is stated to do. Got it. Um, Mr. Goldstein, I was wondering if you could respond to the proposal that I summarized and is in our memo, which is to reduce the 0.05, which I believe that, you know, something you strong, that Matt strongly supports, but then coupling that with diversion. Yeah. One thing I wasn't sure about was what does diversion look like for, you know, as, as I stated, you know, Mad supports interlock devices as diversion and not much else, but I, it, it didn't specifically state what, what the other diversion that's a, measures. That's a very good, be. that's a very good question. The staff will tell you, I have that question almost you know, every time. No, it, of course it varies in who, who's doing the diversion and the, but, um, you know, we heard about the Pennsylvania approach, but it's, 
I think it's some combination of sanctions in terms of um, classes, school, driver's license suspension. The big difference is lack of a criminal conviction. Yeah, I, I think, you know, from Mad's point of view, accountability is, is very important, especially to victims and survivors. Um, I, I think, as Mr. Green was talking We're about with the overrepresentation of black and brown folks in DUI arrests, getting to the bottom of why that is so different than a lot of other states that are, uh, such as Connecticut, or if you look at Fayetteville, North Carolina, where they uh, reprioritized traffic stops to hazardous driving behavior in DUI to 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 uh, I guess counter some of those stops that have equity issues. They found that equity issues decreased with when they increased enforcement of hazardous driving behaviors. Um, so, but I, I guess I, that kind of went against your question. So what, I, I, you... let's just talk about diversion for a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That feels, and how important, I guess, is critical is the criminal conviction from Matt's perspective. How, it, I, I, I'm not really understanding. The main, the main difference between diversion and, and Rick jump in here if I'm wrong. One, at least sort of what seems to be causing harm uh, especially racially disparate harm is the fact that the criminal conviction, the actual criminal conviction in court has mm -hmm. a lot of ramifications um, versus a diversion program, which goes through many of the same uh, steps, schools, interlocks, mm -hmm. driver's license suspension, but doesn't result in a formal criminal conviction. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair summary of the difference? Yes, it, no GL, no probation, but similar other sanctions, including the license suspension, and we, IFD, and so on. And just to be clear, we're talking about first-time offenders, no injury, and no, no injury, no death. Yeah. Yes. Gotcha. So yeah. I was curious about Matt's perspective. Yeah. No, sure. Um, I would probably have to follow up a little bit more outside of the interlock devices, but that really is where we uh, we'd like to see diversion go to those interlock devices, mandatory interlock devices. Um, there was something that Mr. Green said about, about interlocks. Um, I think you talked about uh, indigence, I believe. Um, the, yeah, there's a serious cost. We've, we've, yeah, we've, we've mentioned that, this a couple of times. I don't want to jump in here, but, oh, but sure. and, I, and I see Pris Priscilla has your hand raised. Um, the cost we get, that seems obvious. Everybody's talked about it, and that seems like a obvious fix that the state should pay for. So I don't want to go down that road too oh, much. Well, actually, the the vendor pays for it. All right. Well, whomever, whomever the it should not be borne by the uh, defendant Correct. if it's required. Okay. Correct. Um, Ms. Ochi. Uh So I just want to, as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about this in the context of the other priorities of of the committee, including bail including reducing pretrial detention, reducing jail populations, right? An arrest uh, may or may not result in someone being uh, held um, for any period of time um, in custody, but it may. Uh, and we know that there are real challenges in terms of bail uh, in the state of California. So I'm concerned about the downstream effects in terms of even just a weekend uh, in jail or just a few days in jail can be quite significant in terms of its disruption in people's lives, jobs, uh, et cetera. Um, so I'm wondering if if we can sort of put these two conversations together to think about what impact a reduction in the BAC would have on arrests and potential um, custodial detentions pre-trial um, while a, a person's charge is being uh, adjudicated. Um, so that's one. Two, I quickly looked at some of the data from the Million Dollar Hoods project, um, looking at the, the top five offenses for which people are arrested in places like um, Boyle Heights, Inglewood, um, uh, Hyde Park here in Los Angeles County. And I, I noted that one of the top um, offenses is, or one of the reasons that people are, are held in jails from 2010 to 2019 is driver's license suspension. That was one or two in almost all of those cases. Um, and the other was uh, DUI. 
Uh, and so I'm, uh, again, putting these two things in conversation. Obviously, driver's license suspension is part of the sanction for uh, DUI arrests, and that can also increase the number of contacts that people have uh, with law enforcement if they continue to drive uh, without um, uh, a valid license. And so I'm wondering if um, uh, Mr. Green and Mr. Goldson, if you could respond to the sort of broader impacts of this policy change, either for the, the blood alcohol um, um, component or the diversion component uh, in terms of, again, the number of people that may be held in jails, the consequences for bail, uh, and the types of offenses that may be uh, that may follow in terms of downstream. So that may be violations of of, of the terms of a diversion or um, things like driving on a suspended license. Um, I mean, I can respond quickly. I, I mean, I I know I probably went through my comments uh, uh, quickly because I was trying to uh, make the time. But um, uh, you know, when I was a public defender, it's not just the there's a lot of things that happen pre-trial. So when we would arraign folks, they would be ordered to do all sorts of things before uh, before a conviction. And all those things have costs. Um, so, you know, the scram monitor, for example, uh, is costly. It's a daily cost to people. And the people who could afford it could be out and the people who couldn't wouldn't. So they would end up pleading in most times their, their case out even those who may or may wanted to fight it or whose blood AC was right borderline and maybe a trial could have made an, an, an argument that they weren't actually over the limit. Um, so there's there's all those sort of costs born at the inception um, where your income or lack thereof dictates or determines if you are, if you're out. And then there's all the things that, that come um, after it. Uh, there's the, the cost. So when I was a public defender, again, um, most of the time with DUI cases, because uh, at that time, people didn't really, at, at my office, didn't fully understand all it took to be to get your license back, similar to how to report details, the various um, two pathways for license suspensions. Um, but if you can't afford to pay, or you can't afford to stay in the class or whatever, then your license in, basically ends up being suspended indefinitely. And then we'd have people who would come back over and over again because their uh, license were suspended. And then if you get uh, arrested for driving on suspended license more than once, more than twice, then those penalties also um, continue to, to go up. So for me, the downstream consequences are the economic ones. We talk about this as racialized wealth extraction because many of these costs in the criminal legal system are borne by low income black and brown communities. Um, you know, we had a map at the East Bay Community Law Center interactive. You could layer on ethnicity and income and you could throw a dart and make an assumption about how many driver's license suspensions there are. Um, I, I appreciate that Mr. Goldstein, you know, pointed to other things that can, um, other behaviors that may get um, away from some of the racialized aspects. But for as long as, I mean, before there was any ripping data, we all knew this to be, true it continues to be true so any any from my vantage point anything that you layer on either as a penalty or as a cost or uh or as a requirement is going to be borne by black and brown folks because that is currently how the system operates um and as i pointed out it doesn't it's not consistent with alcohol use rates right similarly to um traffic stops not being commensurate with who actually um, gets caught with contraband, right? Like the numbers should look a lot different, at least for alcohol related DUIs, given what the data suggests as who was the heavy users, but it, it, it doesn't. And I, my concern with, with the system generally is you make a tweak on one end under the, the, the auspices of public safety, but every time there is a tweak made for a public safety reason, the disproportionate negative impact is always on black and brown folks. And there's never like the disproportionate positive impact. I, I hope that's responsive to, to your question. I think those are wonderful points. I think that's, those are absolutely valid points. Mad does not wish to add punitive, you know, costs or damages to uh, communities of color uh, 
you know, Mad's mission is to reduce uh, drunk driving crashes, deaths, and fatalities. Um, and we have to, you know, uh, work within these systems, but also that's why these forums are so important to, to, to bring up these points, uh, points that perhaps MAD doesn't, uh, uh, take into consideration. Uh, I'm not saying that we don't, I'm just saying like in, in certain instances, there are, this is why we collaborate, um, with, with, with these types of groups. Um, one of the recommendations here about streamlining sus license suspension and updating license suspension rules uh, to suspend only once uh, for, you know, and not multiple times. This is something that we uh, sort of have going on in Maryland right now, um, where with interlock devices, we have day for day credit. Uh, and that way you can't get, you know, multiple, um, if you choose to administratively add an interlock device to your car, you can't then get uh, convicted and have to get it again. So it's just, you know, those types of uh, thoughtful policy, uh, I think, while also we, we, we do want to be, uh, to come down on, on, on those that, that do decide to, to make the choice to drive drunk illegally. So, um, I want to throw it over to Rick for a second, um, to summarize, uh, my Zoom starts doing these bubbles. Um, anyhow, Rick, uh, on the data, you know, especially on the racially disparate impact, you know, in, concern with lowering the BAC level to 0.05. I believe Mr. Fell said that there was not an increased number in the total number of arrests in Utah, and acknowledging that Utah is a mostly white state. But um, anyway, I was wondering if you could discuss any data that we have on that. Well, I mean, we could discuss the RIPA data that Steve mentioned earlier, and that shows that people of color are more likely to be stopped, and they're more likely to have actions taken after the stop. That's for all stops. And there's this issue of when we're talking about DUIs, there are stops that occur because a police officer observes bad driving that's indicative of DUI. I don't think changing the standard to 0.05 is going to make police officers observe more bad driving. So stops in that category would stay the same. There's also pretext stops where officer is making stops for an unrelated reason. They're stopping somebody for an expired registration or a headlight being out. We know those stops are used dis disproportionately against people of color. Again, I don't think a 0.05 uh, per se limit is going to result in more pre pretext stops. What it does result in, so I don't think it results in more stops. However, it does result, it could result in more arrests because once the people are stopped for either of those reasons, whether it be bad driving or a pretextual reason, now you have cases where an officer would have uh, subjected a, a person to uh, a preliminary alcohol screening device, a breath test. They would have cut them out at the end of the uh, encounter because they blew under a 0 0.08, let's say. But now with a 0 0.05 law, somebody who blows between a 0.05 and a 0.05 or higher is now going to be arrested. So it could result in, it could result in increased arrest. Obviously the Utah study suggests that that did not happen. Um, and again, there's evidence, you know, you say it didn't happen along racial lines or didn't happen at all. There weren't an increased number of arrests. There weren't an increased number of arrests. I don't think we could really draw conclusions along racial lines because of the unique dem demographics of Utah. But I mean, it's certainly a possibility that there could be increased arrest and that that would disproportionately impact people of color because they are uh, disproportionately stopped. However, I think the the, quite, the the issue becomes how do you make sure that uh, what happens after the stop is is done uh, with equity, increase, improved equity, and then in, 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 includes what Brandon is talking about in, in terms of making sure that uh, any type of sanction is affordable and accessible to people is, is a huge part of it. And I think that, you know, this committee has already recommended that the state take steps to improve equity and traffic stops and that those efforts need to continue separate and apart from anything that we're doing with DUI laws that we need improved traffic equity in California generally. And, and Tom, following up on that, we did make, you give us an update on our license suspension recommendation. And I believe that was a carve out for DUI. So can you just 
brief us quickly on that? Well, license suspension recommendation had to do with suspensions that were for failure to uh, appear in court. So it was just limited to that. And that um, has passed, but because of some um, implementation issues with the DMV, it's, it has a, it's not going to phase in for another few years. So it didn't, it didn't touch on the DUI issue. Um, but I, I also wanted to add real quickly to what Rick was saying. Um, you know, and I think this has come up, the median BAC for people who are convicted is, is double 0.08 right now. So most people who are stopped are, are way over the um, 0.08 limit. So I think that's why it's this really interesting discussion around sort of general deterrence from the message being, okay, it's now easier to get a DUI, but the reality is most people who are driving are already above the, the current legal limit. So the question of how much more arrest it's going to lead to is really interesting. I mean, there obviously will be people who will have been arrested that wouldn't have been in the past, but I think there's reason to think it, you know, because so many people are already over that 0.08 limit significantly, um, that it wouldn't, <laughs> it wouldn't, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to figure out. And as Rick said, you don't even need a certain BAC to be, you know, convicted or arrested for a, a DUI. Obviously, that's where most of the discussion is because it's much easier to think about that way. But that part of the law, I don't think would change. Rick, make, make, let me make sure I understand your math. Disproportionate number of people of color are stopped. If we increase the number of breathalyzers that are being given to everybody who's ever stopped for anything, that's just going to have continue the racially disparate impact of arrests because we're going to have more arrests. It could, but I think as you'll hear from our next panel with CHP officers, officers already have the ability to arrest a person for DUI regardless of the blood alcohol content that they blow. The question for officers is, is this person impaired? And a blood alcohol content is relevant to that question. It may help officers determine if a person is impaired, but currently if somebody blows a 0 0.05, a 0 0.06, and an officer determines that they're impaired, the, the person can still be arrested. So I think it's a it's a good question about whether or not there would be in, increased racial disparities or increased arrests uh, if the if the standard was changed. I think it's a it's a, certainly a possibility, but I don't I don't know that it's a certainty that we can expect increased arrests. And for what it's worth, the Utah study shows that there there were not. Got it. Um, we only have a couple of minutes. Oh, uh, Mr. Green, and then I have a question for Mr. Goldstein. Can I, can I just say something quickly on that? So. Of, of course, police currently have this ability, right? Because police have a wide latitude of discretion. And the wide the, the wide range of discretion is why the racial disparities exist, right? Like who does and does not look criminal? Who does and does not look suspicious? Who does or does not have things that could be an indication of being impaired, but might not be an indication of in, being impaired? What the officer does or does not do after they observe those things are all the reasons that the racial disparities exist. So it's absolutely true. Somebody could blow a 0.05 and the officer could arrest him. It's also true that somebody could blow 0.05 and the officer could say, just, just get home, right? And the... The window of discretion is why the the racialized stuff exists. So I just want to I just want to raise that. And you know, as I said in my in my public comment, like yes, we have the Utah study, but we don't have any other thing. Right. right? And I, I, I wanted to jump. I wanted that gets to something I want to make sure that I understood your position. Your position is is that we're not sure that lowering the BAC level is actually going to have that much of an impact on road safety. So, yeah, I, I just don't think we have any, we have, there was two studies cited. Sufficient data. Not and, and sufficient you, data. Right. One was on one side, one was on the other, and there's oh, nothing. I get it. I just want to make it, I'm sure I understand your. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Assembly member Brian. Uh, incredible conversation. Uh, the last few panels have been incredibly insightful. Um, I too have kind of general concerns with overgeneralizing the the Utah study. Um, I think we all, and, and was explained by by even um, the last panelist, that there are deep kind of cultural and societal differences that make Utah already an anomaly prior to changing to 05. Um, when it was 0.08, they still had uh, noticeably um, lower rates of impaired driving uh, and fatalities due to impaired driving. And so I'm just I'm I'm concerned about taking that 
that study and generalizing it uh, to the point that it would be a, a recommendation for one in eight Americans, right? If California does this. Um, and so just want to be, be, be mindful um, of that. I don't know that I'm, I'm fully convinced yet um, that going to 0.05, one doesn't have negative uh, externalities, in, in, including exacerbating racialized outcomes um, for all of the reasons that were mentioned um, by Mr. Green. Um, I think this conversation is, is is wildly important and I'm glad we're having it. Uh, but I just wanted to, to put that out there that if, if we're staking our kind of our domestic research claim on evidence from Utah, I, I think that's that's tricky for a state um, as massive and diverse and complicated as California. Oh, I, I certainly agree. Just one note on math. My understanding is, is that because Utah was already lower, that the decrease there is even more meaningful and measurable because... because Correct. And, and, you know, thinking about kind of the compounding effects, I mean, it, it could be that, you know, state law in Utah is now also you know, bolstering uh, a widespread and understood religious ideology um, and that those interacting effects have a greater, you know, social control over behaviors than, than it might be in other places, right? And I don't know that for sure either, but I, I know that the study is, you know, it, it's hard to, I, I think those things are definitely related and there is, um, I imagine a, a positive coefficient, although I haven't read the study, um, associated with with the timing of that law and that decrease uh, and that having some explanatory power, but I don't think that it has enough explanatory power to um, to overcome some of the complications of a, of a state like California. And, and Mike, if, if I can add real quick, I, there are there are more than two studies. The, yeah. Those are sort of the ones that we highlighted um, in the in the staff memo because they were, you know, the Utah one is obviously of, of import, but uh, in the submission that um, Dr. Fell gave, he, you know, he cites a number of studies in a number of, of countries, which also, you know, looking at studies and, you know, research in other countries is not always totally translatable to the U.S., but I, but I think um, it's not just Utah and Scotland. There, there is a, a bigger re research base. So I just wanted to, to make that clear. And that's um, a lot of what um, Dr. Fell uh, focused on and, and gave to the committee today. I, I think it's important too, to recognize that the, in, in one of the studies and this was a 2015 is that the risk of being involved in a crash uh, significantly increases at 0.05. So. Right. We, 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 the four drinks over an hour, I think sort of hit home to everybody like, Oh yeah, that, you know. Um, so can you tell us, and I'm going to give you the last, Rick, did you have something that you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to mention, I think we we cite the Utah study as the only example of what happened when a state in the United States reduced its BAC as kind of, you know, for take it for what it's worth. You know, it's a different place. And this is the only, you know, firm example of this state lowered its BAC to 0 0.08 to 0 0.05. And here's what we observed. But kind of, and, and I think there, as everybody's bringing up, there are very important equity concerns in terms of does this widen the net? Does it uh, decrease equity? Or does it bring more people of color into the system? And those are all important. But I think apart from kind of thinking about, you know, what could happen when a person, if the BAC was lowered to 0.05, there is a large body of evidence that we cite in the, in the report and that other groups have looked at, including the National Academy of Sciences, that shows that people are impaired at 0.05. So there is this question of, you know, what are the impacts of lowering to 0.05 that is, you know, mixed, and we don't really know how to interpret Utah's findings. But I think the findings on what does, should a person drive at a 0.05, I think that's even more clear from the laboratory studies. And there's more groups that are more, you know, firm on that question of at a 0.05, you are pretty significantly impaired and shouldn't be driving. And I think that evidence is more clear and more direct. Yeah, and I, I just want to touch on on that real real briefly. I, I don't think any of us disagree on that at all. Um, I, I think that the role that uh, alcohol and other substances, you know, play in society, especially when it comes to our primary modes of transportation um, in, in vehicle, it, that is that is to me self evident. The question I think we're grappling with is 
what kind of statewide interventions can we have to save lives and improve traffic safety outcomes uh, without, you know, without leaning on a system that has not shown to, to deter this behavior to the extent that we already would hope um, that it would. I mean, I think in a, in a perfect world, you don't drink anything and drive. Um, whether whether you are significantly impaired, slightly impaired, or just mildly impaired, right? And we're certainly not weighing folks and measuring their drinks um, before we let them into vehicles. I mean, there, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of reasons this this behavior is complicated. And I just want to make sure that our our solutions aren't rooted, you know, solely in the criminal legal system um, that has shown to have both net widening effects, racialized effects, uh, and disproportionate or disparate enforcement um, if if we're not going to get the expected results because it's very hard to go backwards. Uh, if we go 0.05, for example, in California, the rest of the country likely will follow quickly. And, and it's unlikely that we will decide, you know what, this really hadn't reduced as much as we thought. And we're, we're seeing racialized disparities go back. Let's go ahead and raise the legal alcohol back up to 0.08. Um, you know, I, I think this is, it, we just want to be very certain before we make a recommendation like this for California. All right, um, thank you both. Um, the conversation uh, continues. We're gonna hear from law enforcement next. So I think- Matt, ask one quick question, just as you're wrapping. Uh, can can you point me where I can uh, find how they talks about the, the impairment? Because my understanding is, for example, getting less than six hours of sleep impair you in the same way or at close to the same way as like 0.05 uh blood alcohol right like so i i i just would like to be able to dig a little bit deeper um in, into it there are some other things i want to say but i didn't have a chance to so if you could just i, I could follow up with rick offline um, yeah about follow up with rick rick we'll, we'll get you the studies and vice versa please get in touch with us by writing this goes for everybody else in the public um, you know, to follow up by email if there are other points that you want to add. We really appreciate um, everybody's time. We could go on, go on, go on and on, but we want to hear from as many different perspectives as possible. Um, thank you both. We're going to take a very quick five-minute uh, break before our next panel. Uh, we'll re reconvene at uh, 11.53.